Today's the day when we finally take a look at every single Daniel Smith watercolor. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I cannot believe how long it has taken us to get to this video. I am so excited. I have been wanting to do a dot card video for you forever basically, but I've been holding back for a number of different reasons. For starters, I actually already have two of these cards personally. I have purchased all of these myself with my own money, but the first set I did was when I first started getting into watercolors before I even had a channel. I went ahead and spent the time watching YouTube videos and swatching out this chart, but I was always a little disappointed with this one just because the sample size are admittedly pretty small on the dot cards and so I wasn't able to get like a full saturation on some of the colors. So fast forward a little while later, I got another set of dot cards so that I could go ahead and swatch them on the chart and just have their true uh, depth, their mass tone represented in my chart. And that's the one I've been going off of for a while. Since those were both done, I believe this one for sure, I think this one also, um, before I got my watercolor channel going here on YouTube, I've never come back to that topic and today's the day when that finally changed. So I bought another dot card for us, which their dot cards have 238 colors. It's a little confusing as to why that is because if you take a look here on the last page, there are two extra spots available that are on the page. And guess what? Daniel Smith doesn't have 238 colors. They have 252 colors currently. So I spent actually a lot of hours over the course of many months, I don't know exactly how long, going through my old dot cards, the information online, and my new dot cards to try and figure out what colors were not included on this new dot card. Voice over Denise coming at you for just a second. I had a really hard time explaining this card for some reason. There are two or three different components on this card and it actually will end up growing over the course of this video. Uh, but basically one of our amazing viewers, Grace, who lives near the Daniel Smith uh, store in Washington, agreed to go pick up some samples for me. I am so, so thankful to them. So thank you so much, Grace, for doing that for me. They were able to pick up uh, several colors that are not available on the dot cart but are available online. And then I also went through and pulled colors that used to be available on their dot card and are no longer available and put those on myself. Over the course of the video, there'll be more, but I'll explain when we get there. So back into the real time footage. I hope I got a chance to say everything that I meant to say in that intro. To be honest, I recorded it a few times and there was so much I wanted to get in there that uh, we'll just have to hope for the best and I can chat with you about anything else that comes up along the way. I'm sure there will be lots. Now one thing that I wish that Daniel Smith's cards had on them and I considered writing them all on here before we got started was that I wish that the pigment numbers were on here. Everything else is, but um, it's 255 colors. So <laughs> um, I didn't go ahead and write them all out, but they are available on their brochure, which was around here somewhere a second ago. So if you wanted to go ahead and uh, get this for yourself as well, which is a free resource uh, that you can get from them, they have all the pigments on here and you could cross-reference the two. Save your hand some work. And this card that I got actually has some, like there's splotches everywhere. I'm not quite sure where they came from. And I also think I'm gonna end up dragging my hand through a bunch of paint. So let me go ahead and cover this up while we are working so that I don't do that. It has been such a long time since I've worked with their dot cards. Now you're gonna notice that these are hand poured dot cards. So the size of the dot, if you haven't seen them before, is gonna change from swatch to swatch because it was a real human who was swatching them out. And a lot of this one in particular are like dragged across the page. I'm not sure what that's about, but <laughs> um, it is what it is. And Daniel Smith's cards go down the line instead of across. So it's gonna be a little bit different than the other ones where I've been doing them in rows rather than columns. I think 
Is that all the, nope, it's not all the information you probably wanna know. <laughs> if you've never seen this dot card before, you can head on over to my Amazon shop. I'll put a link in the description below um, where you can pick one up for yourself. It's usually around $22 USD for the 238 colors. And um, you can go ahead and try them all out for yourself. The reason I recommend these is because it's in, in one way, it's expensive to, to see, oh, okay, I'm gonna spend $22 on just a sheet of dots. But on the other hand, that's only about the equivalent of less than two tubes of Daniel Smith paint. So if you wanna not risk buying a tube of paint that you're never going to use, I would recommend it because it'll help you in the long run. Now I'm not saying that it's perfect. These are tiny little samples of paint and I have definitely still made decisions based on this dot card or based on decisions that I thought I would really enjoy. And it turned out that I didn't end up using them as much as I thought I would, but this was still a better guess than trying to either look at swatches uh, solely online. Obviously that's what I'm doing here. So I hope that this video is useful for you still um, in giving you an idea of what you want to purchase, but nothing really compares to the real thing of seeing them in person yourself. So I've gone through kind of quickly here just because I didn't want to keep you waiting while I was rambling about all that technical stuff, but we start the column with Buff Titanium, which is a fairly unique to Daniel Smith color in terms of professional lines, although a lot of handmade watercolorists are starting to offer that in theirs as well. Then we have Nickel Titanate Yellow, which is kind of an opaque, soft, coolish yellow. Um, I know that Sadie, uh, Sade from Sadie Saves the Day likes to use this one a lot, so you can check out her channel if you wanna see more about that one. And I also know Otto makes a version of this too with her handmade paints. Um, then we've got Bismuth Vanadate Yellow. There's gonna be some colors on here you've never heard of because with 252 colors, I mean, they have to get pretty creative with the naming, right? Um, it's pretty intense. So Hansa Yellow Light is your PY3. That's the typical yellow that a lot of people recommend starting with just because it's so nice and bright and vibrant, but it is slightly light, less light fast than some of your other options. So just keep that in mind. Azo Yellow is a really great choice as well. And then we've got Cadmium Yellow Light Hue. Daniel Smith actually doesn't offer any cadmium colors in their line anymore. They've removed all of them and replaced them with uh, hues. So if you want a cadmium color, you are gonna have to look to a different brand, but if you want a replacement, a non-toxic replacement for them, you can go ahead and check out Daniel Smith as well. I'm going to try and do my best to remember as we're going along here to take my little bonus sheet and when we get to a color that is matching some of the other colors that we're working on, I'm going to swatch it out for you. So this is actually the dot sample that Grace was able to pick up for me. I only know from people who have told me and Grace's account uh, that you're allowed to take really big samples from the Daniel Smith store. They just have them out and you're allowed to put them on paper and take them home. So. Clearly, these are very generous and uh, I'm very glad to have them. And the first one that we're gonna come up to is Quinaphthalone, Quinaphthalone, Quinaphthalone Yellow. Um, and this one is made from uh, PY138. I did write the pigment numbers on these little charts since I had to print them out anyway. And they were all gonna be colors I was less familiar with for the most part. This is a gorgeous bright yellow. This is the first time I'm ever seeing it painted out. We'll have to see how that dries. Um, but it is a, oh, let me tell you that. How about, how about I tell you what these little markings meant? I meant to do this sooner, I'm sorry. Okay, so on Daniel Smith's dot card. Let's focus camera, can you do it? Excellent. Okay, we've got our common name, cadmium yellow medium hue. It's a series three, which is how much the paint costs. Series one is the cheapest, series five is the most expensive. They have a serial number that I literally never refer to ever, but it's there if you want it. The first number is light fastness. That's on a light fast rating of uh, Roman numeral one to four. Uh, this is the best light fastness at light fast one. 
It is a moderately staining pigment. They have a staining scale from one to four, so two is a low staining color. And then it is non-granulating, N for non-granulating, G for granulating. Am I, yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> N for no, yes, uh, Y for yes. So if it's a granulating color, it'll have a Y there. And then the last one is transparency. So they rate theirs on transparent, semi-transparent, or opaque. Um, the other thing that you might see on this card somewhere, I don't think there are any on the first page. Hey, Rodenite should be on there, right? Did I just miss it? Ah, yes, I missed it. Okay, it's right here. P for Primatech. Um, so that's the Primatech line. Uh, if you're wondering about the breakdown of their colors, they've got 35 Primatech colors, they've got 48 iridescent and interference colors, and the remaining 169 colors are all in the standard range of spectral colors and earth tones and that kind of thing. All right, now that we have all that information out of the way, <laughs> it's hard, guys, like having all this information and things I want to cover and having you not get bored and click off the video right away. But I think we're good. So this quinaphthalone yellow is super stunning. It's so vibrant. I mean, Lightfast 2 isn't the best, but I mean, there's other yellows that I use that are Lightfast 2, so. It's always curious to me when they don't include colors on their, um, the dock chart and I guess at the end of the video maybe we'll try and I'll try and remember to take a look at all the colors that they didn't include and see if we can figure out why they didn't include them maybe it's a price point maybe they're low stock I have absolutely no idea and those are just conjecture so I am curious about that yellow though um, there are two colors on the printout sheet that um, I have in my collection that I didn't ask Grace to pick up for me, but that I knew weren't on this dot card, and that's going to be neutral tint, and then also the um, purpurite. How is your view? I hope it's okay. I'm not having you zoomed in super, super tight so that you have some comparisons on the page. You can see what else is going on, but I wanted it to be tighter than completely zoomed out. Now, even though Daniel Smith doesn't carry cadmium colors, they do still carry cobalt colors, and this is one of them, Aurelian, which is not a light fast color. You can check out Otto's channel. She has more information about that. Unless this is a hue and I don't know about it. I should say hue, they're pretty good about that. Let's check. Yep, that's true PY40 Aurelian. Next we have Lemon Yellow. This is one of my favorites and I'm actually trying to think if this is new or not. This is a color that they don't actually usually carry in stores. You have to order it online if you want it. But I don't know if it was on. I just pushed paint all over my brochure. Was it on the brochure? It was, okay. I just didn't see it, I guess. So a lot of companies call Lemon Yellow, um, or they call their PY3 Lemon Yellow. Daniel Smith is actually made from PY175. It is more light fast, more transparent. It's a gorgeous color, and I don't know why people don't use it more often. And I have no idea why it's not in more stores, because it's super pretty. I love it. Then we've got our Cadmium Yellow Deep Hue. Now I will tell you, I think they switched their paper that this is on and it's kind of funny timing because I'm redoing the Swatch With Me series so that they're on better paper. However, once again, I am not enough of a self masochist to make myself reprint uh, all of this information uh, for 255 colors. So 
the paper that we're on is just what we're going to get, unfortunately. But I thought it was the same. It feels the same. Maybe I just don't remember clearly. I can kind of see what I'm looking at is that some of this cut turns kind of like a grayish color when it gets wet. So I'm a little concerned about that, but we're still seeing the mass tone in this area here. So I think we're still okay. We'll see. Onto our second row, we've got Hansi Yellow Medium. I believe this is PY97 for Daniel Smith. It's a beautiful middle of the road yellow. I've not actually ever used it uh, on a regular palette, but that's just because I've had yellows available to me. I'm getting really annoyed with these little orange dots that are flung all over the page. They're messing up my yellows. Um, oh, you couldn't see that. I thought I was on camera. I thought I was being good. Silly me. All right, anyway, that's Hans Yellow Medium, PY97. Uh, it's a beautiful color. I tend to use PY154, but PY97 is basically the same hue. So whichever one you have access to or is available. This next one is a Mayan color, Maya Yellow. It's a transparent yellow. Light fastness of two. Non-granulating. It's actually a really gorgeous color. And honestly, I don't know why I wasn't like interested in trying that one out before either. Let's look. Indian, nope. Mine yellow is made from PY223. It's only available in a 15 milliliter tube, but that does look like a beautiful middle bright clear violet. And I'm always a fan of transparent yellows because they're so hard to find. If you guys have Maya yellow, let me know how you like using it. Naples yellow is one that I have tried back very early in the start of my watercolor journey. When I thought I was going to end up painting more people, I went on like this kick where I bought a bunch of um, like portrait tone specific colors and built a an earth tone palette. But I later found out that you actually don't need to do that and you can use like colors you already have. So um, this color can be useful for landscape painters as well, or I think maybe an urban sketching, but I don't have a lot of uses for it myself. Um, it's a combination of multiple pigments. Next is Indian Yellow. This is another transparent yellow. It is a combination of two different pigments, I believe. Are you guys all like taking bets on how long it takes me to open up this pamphlet and just leave it next to me? Because whoever has this timestamp is about to win. <laughs> We're going to put this up so we can see it. All right, Indian Yellow is PY97, so that Hansi Yellow Medium, and PY150, so Nickel uh, Titanium Yellow. That's probably why I didn't try it before, is because when I first built my palette, I was staying away from all even semi-toxic paints. Um, I've gotten a bit leaner over, or more, more lenient, there we go, more lenient over the years about what I allow in just because I review so many products and you guys send me awesome things, so I try not to be as much of a stickler about it anymore. Hansi Yellow Deep is one that I have had on my palette since the very beginning. That's PY65. Single color, it's semi-transparent, light fast. The other alternative that you might use instead of that color is New Gamboge, which is just a tiny bit more orange. and it's more transparent. So you're trading a single pigment color for a multi-pigment color, but this one is more transparent. It's made from PY97 again, the Hansa Yellow Medium, and PY110, which is another yellow. Do we have PY110 yet? I don't know if they offer a single pigment variety of that color. I don't think they do. I can never say this word for some reason. I know it's not that hard, but 
Izzo and Indeline. It Izzo Indeline Yellow. I believe this is one of viewer sent me. It's PY139. I have a half pan of it, or like a quarter pan, I guess. It's a half pan with a sample in it. It's a really, really bold. My box got wonky there. Sorry about that, folks. Um, it's, it, <laughs> I'm stuttering in my words here. It resembles macaroni and cheese to me. This is macaroni and cheese orange, or at least craft macaroni and cheese, the blue box, as I think other parts of the world know it as, or as we just call it, craft. And then we've got permanent yellow deep. I think yellow is a stretch here. I really do when, <laughs> when we're getting into this range. I think yellow orange is a little bit more appropriate in terms of a descriptor for sure. This is made, oh, this is the PY110. Oh, look at that, okay. So new gamboge, I was thinking PY110 was a lighter yellow for some reason, but the new gamboge is gonna be your PY97 and your permanent yellow deep combined. So if you had both of those yellows on your palette, you wouldn't need new gamboge because you could mix it together if that makes sense. But if you just really like New Gamboge and want that on your palette instead of other yellows, you can do that too. I think that's kind of Daniel Smith's business model. There aren't really 255 viable, like unique individual single pigment colors in watercolor, right? So a lot of their colors are convenience mixtures that are beautiful and we love them anyway and we want them in our collections. Nothing wrong with that. They do offer their single pigments also. But that's how they have so many more colors than other brands. This was one of their new 2017 colors. I did a video on that uh, here on the channel. If I remember, I'll link it, but who knows? <laughs> these longer videos are hard to link like that but you can find it pretty easily on the channel it's in the swatch with me playlist and this Aussie red gold is made from three different pigments I believe PY83 PR101 and PV19 it is transparent and a very very rich red gold as the name would suggest I believe almost all of the colors Daniel Smith added, if I'm remembering correctly, in 2017 were uh, multi-pigment paints, just because they have all the other ones. All right, we've got Pyro Orange, which is different than Transparent Pyro Orange, which is the one that I use more often. This one is almost fluorescent, like it is so punchy and in your face bright. It is made from PO73. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten one of these colors. The next one we have is a red. I know you'll shout it out and remind me because that's how these videos work, right? <laughs> you guys, I know that some of, some of the viewers like watch these and are like, Denise, you're just rambling on and on and on. And while many of you like it, I have to say, like, you gotta give me a little credit. I'm talking to myself with some dots of paint for probably like two hours. Oh, I didn't tell you that either. I'm gonna try and make this a uh, two part video. One part would be ridiculous. It's four pages of dot cards. Uh, but I also don't wanna break it up into four videos uh, if I can help it. So I'm gonna aim to do two sheets in this video and two sheets in the second video. This is permanent orange, uh, made from PO62, so that's your bright, like, Halloween-y orange color. They list it as transparent, which is curious. And they list this as semi-transparent, which I could, I mean, they don't have this denomination, but I would say it's semi-opaque, if anything. And I would probably classify this one as semi-transparent, but 
we don't have the opacity tests on these ones, so keep that in mind. <coughs> I got a little tickle in my throat, pardon me. Uh, here is Paranone Orange. Another like super bright, almost fluorescent color. I feel like my boxes are not exactly uh, perfect here, huh? I'm hoping Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope that this footage turns out okay. I know that the oranges in my Holbein video were just all over the place. It was so hard to calibrate that so that you guys were getting the true sense of the color, but do keep in mind that I do go through and edit the clips, and if they are completely wrong, I will edit that section of the video to reflect the colors that I'm working on. I think I wrote that out in the Holbein video, but I didn't know it was happening, so I couldn't have addressed it in my speech. But just so you guys know, um, since you're listening this time, if this is off and I have to adjust the color, I'm going to adjust it for this range and the yellows would be skewed, so it might look a little funny. It's easier to control when I'm doing the rows versus the columns because I can cover it. The rows I'm not working on. I turned my phone appropriately on Do Not Disturb now, uh, but I was saying this is my favorite orange, transparent pyro orange. Well, at least my favorite on this page. I do like quinacridone burnt orange too, but that's with the earth tones. A box got wonky again. I just love the richness of this color. I think it's so beautiful. It's such a good mixer. You can mix an instant dark black with it. If you are new to the channel, maybe finding this video for the first time. I have other content that is less uh, stream of consciousness <laughs> in painting and more put together. And I have a series called uh, My Favorites, My Top Five Favorites and I go through every color category. So I went through like my favorite oranges, my favorite yellows, my favorite reds. And you guys can get more insights on what you might use specific colors for in that series. I've also got the color spotlight series. We take a look at just one pigment in multiple brands. That's Organic Vermilion, which I believe is a hue because the real one is toxic. Yeah, this is a naphthol pigment. It's a red pigment, so not the real deal. I was pretty sure if Daniel Smith cared about removing their cadmium colors, they would also remove their vermilion. It wouldn't make any sense for them to keep it. Here's our mine orange and it's not that this is hard to rewet, it's just probably the hardest so far. You can still see I'm getting a beautiful color payoff, but it was a little bit less intense to jump off right away. That's another really pretty one. Um, there's no pigment number for that. It says PO, so pigment orange, NA, not applicable. Some pigments just don't have pigment numbers assigned to them, which is interesting to me. Then we're moving into the first of our reds. This is a uh, quinacridone coral. I believe they're quinacridone corals made from PR209. Yes, that is accurate. It is a transparent color like most of the quinacridones and it's got, um, in other brands, this would be called quinacridone red. It's a very, it's a bright color that I wanna say has cool undertones, but at the same time it has orange undertones. I don't know how it does two at the same time, but <laughs> I can never really classify that one. And it's obviously grouped here with the oranger colors, so Daniel Smith must think that as well. Next we have Pyral Scarlet, which is back to another more semi-opaque orangey red pigment.
I'm trying to put, I know it's not evident in all these, I'm trying to put a little bit more water at the tail end of these and let it kind of bleed so you can see multi values of a color, but it's a little hard with the ones that have the tails. So I'll work on that. I'm sure by the time we get to page four, it'll be gorgeous. <laughs> So this color, Perlene Scarlet, is one that I just recently kind of like refound. I know that I've done the dot cards before, but it's never been on my palette and I've not played with it at all. Um, but recently Otto sent me a dot card um, from her Patreon that had all the Perlene colors on it. And I already love Perlene Green and Perlene Violet and uh, Perlene Maroon, and this one has to join them. It's so beautiful. It's not as light fast. It's not rated by the ASTM, but Daniel Smith has given it a light fastness of two. It is staining. It does granulate a little bit, which is interesting according to Daniel Smith. And it is made from PR149. But it's just got this richness to it that's so beautiful. We should be able to get rid of my little hand guard here soon. Here's Cad Red Medium Hue. I guess we haven't gone over too many of the components of their cadmium colors. I haven't mentioned that at all. Yeah, this, this paper has a really hard time with gradients, guys. It's not the paint's fault. That's unfortunate. That's okay. Anyway, um, this cadmium red hue is made from PR254, which is this next color here, pyro red, and PY53, which is that nickel titanate yellow. So I think that yellow gives it a bit of its opacity, makes it a little less fire engine-y red, but there's obviously more of that, this red pigment in there. Pyro red has been a color that has been on my palette since the beginning as well. Um, I do remember when I first was putting together my palette, I had decided on this color, but the art store that I went to was out of Daniel Smith's. So I did have to buy it from Windsor Newton. So I had their Windsor red. For a while, but it was the same pigment number. I think the mass tones on this page are really accurate, but the um, the tints are going to be a little bit harder to completely properly judge just due to the paper's issues. The instructions that this comes with do say to put your brush, like pick up the paint and put your brush to paper. So I assume that they mean a different piece of paper, but as I mentioned, I had a hard time doing those other swatches, especially on the cotton paper because it's so absorbent. I actually think that there's more pigment on this one than there was on my last. My last swatch card. I had some pretty small dots on that last one. Paraline Red is the final Paraline color in addition to the ones that I already mentioned. Um, I don't love it as much as the other Paraline colors, but it's still really pretty. It's got a little bit more of a muted tone than a Pyral Red. It's a little darker, a little deeper. In every other regard though, it's the same as Pyral Red in terms of light fastness, staining, granulation, opacity, and price. So pick whichever one you like better. Funnily enough, and this is in multiple brands, not just Daniel Smith, uh, lately I've been noticing that a lot of permanent versions of colors or colors that have the word permanent in them are not actually like the highest light fastness, which is always funny to me. Uh, but this permanent red here has a light fast rating of two. It's a very staining color and it's made from, oh, this is the weird one. I saw it on Otto's channel. I'm gonna show it to you because it's confusing to read off. It's that PR170 with a bunch of letters and numbers after it. F3RK-70. 
Real weird. Maybe Otto can tell us down below if she ever found out more about that. I think it was in her um, Daniel Smith color showdown. All right, permanent red deep. Ooh, I like this color better. Just initially swatching it out. It's got more intensity to it, more depth. It is cooler. Series one. Oh, permanent red is series one as well. Uh, permanent red deep is made. Oh, it has, you probably noticed it, and I just didn't. It also has the same PR 170 and then F. 5RK are the numbers after that one. Then we've got quinacridone red, which for Daniel Smith is PV19, and it's just going to be a redder variety of PV19, which it is. It's not quite as pink, um, but this color might be called quinacridone rose in other brands. It's definitely cool enough to be considered a rose, I think. Um, and you can compare that to the coral. So a lot of brands call this coral quinacridone red and this one, but Daniel Smith also has, I think, more quinacridone colors than other brands. So maybe they felt they had to push their naming a little bit different. All right, this one reminded me, this is anthraquinoid red and we didn't do anthraquinoid scarlet yet. So we'll do that on our little other sheet. After this, this is beautiful. I think I remember looking at this color and thinking about putting it on my palette instead of Carmine, which is what made it onto my palette originally. We'll get to that on the next row. But this is super stunning. It's um, PR177 and it's a transparent deep bold red and that's hard to find. Um, so Anthraquinoid Scarlet is going to be a more orange variety, but let's see what that looks like because I also have not seen this color before. I feel ridiculous, like, like my little tiny swatch brush trying to pull color off this big old dot. Uh, this little piece of paper is Aqua B. And then some of them have the Daniel Smith paper attached to it. Like I just cut out the dot from the old one. This is interesting. It's made from PR168, which I've not seen before. It's definitely got like a corally scarlet tone to it. It'll be interesting to see what it looks like when it dries. I would put it somewhere around here. So we'll see. Oh, this anthraquinoid red though. Why did I add that to my palette? So pretty. Next up is Mayan red. Um, this is probably the driest looking paint that we've seen so far, maybe in addition to the Mayan orange. But unlike mine orange, which was semi-transparent, this one is supposed to be transparent. A little hard to get to mass tone right away, but once that water seeps in, we should get some more payout. I don't want to drop too much water on there because the paper can't handle it. The only thing that I'm ever sad about when I work on dot cards like this is that if I ever want to go back to some of the bigger dot cards or dot swatches to make dot cards, I have to ruin my nice little glaze I've already put down. Here's a Lizard and Crimson, and this is their Fugitive version. They have both. So this is PR83. It's super beautiful but just don't expect it to last for very long. I believe Otto has a Daniel Smith color showdown on this one as well, comparing these two to each other. 
So the next one is Permanent Alizarin and Crimson, which is their answer to a more permanent version. Already I can tell you this version is way more red and less cool, but maybe it'll dry differently. I don't exactly recall. I know I watched Otto's video, but I don't remember exactly. I think it was that this one mixes similarly to this color. Like on its own, it doesn't look the same, but it mixes similarly, but I could be wrong on that. Go watch Otto's video. <laughs> She'll be able to tell you. Uh, but let's see. This one is made from PR177, so the anthraconoid red, no wonder. It's nice, pretty color, but it's also made with PV19 and PR149, so it's a three-color blend. All right, I think we can put aside my little hand guard for now. I can navigate around two rows of color anyway. Here's the Rhodonite Genuine. I know that this color is hard to rewet. I have it on my palette, so I'm going to put a nice bead of water on top of it, and we're going to come back to it in like two swatches or something. Here's Carmine. This is the one that I originally picked for myself, and admittedly, I think I'm only in love with it because it was one of my first palette colors and probably not much other reason. I have used other colors since then that are equally, if not even more beautiful, but still come back to the Carmine. I don't know, sentimental attachment. It's a light fast rating of two, but in my personal light fastness tests over six months, in a south facing window getting sunlight every single day because I live in California, it did not fade at all. So don't have to worry about that in our lifetimes anyway, I don't think. Then we've got Rose Matter Permanent. Oh, I don't like this. It's weird. Um, it's made from PR209, so that quinacridone coral, PV19, and PR202. So quinacridone coral, quinacridone magenta, and quinacridone rose. That's real weird. <laughs> like, let's put all the quinacridone colors together. It also seems to have a lot of binder in it. It's really glossy. I mean, I guess if you really want a light, fast, transparent red, then sure, but I think you can just go with a straight up quinacridone color also. Maybe a floral painter would find this useful. It's a really soft red, but I wouldn't have a need for it. Okay, here's Road Knight Genuine. Soaked in a little bit. Now I heard someone talk about this, maybe it was Otto? Whoever it was, comment down below <laughs> if you're watching this, um, that this color wasn't light fast. Maybe it was Jane Blundell, I don't know. Um, it's rated as light fast, but someone said it changed color. Um, it might have had something to do, you know what, it probably was in Otto, she's doing a Primatex series right now. Maybe that's where I heard it. Um, Something about it oxidizing with the light, I think. Again, don't take my exact word for it. But I heard something about it. You can look into it. This is special. Before I swatch it out, I just want to show you. Nope, I lied. <laughs> I thought it was special. I didn't think I'd tried the opera pink before. It was the rose matter that was covered up before. It used to be their genuine version, and they took that off because it was fugitive. So the last two swatch cards that I got from them did not have this color on it. I was thinking it was opera, but that's Sinelli that did that. So uh, we finally got to see the Rose Matter Permanent. So that was actually my first time seeing that color and why I wouldn't have remembered having that reaction before. Um, and then here's Opera Pink, which I have seen. You know, I think actually that Rose Matter Permanent was probably one of their new 2017 colors. Is that accurate? And then I would have tried it on that little tiny dot card. They had like a little mini set of eight colors. Your opera pink is also fugitive. It's fugitive in every brand. Uh, and what'll happen to it is that the fluorescent pigment is gonna fade. Otherwise it has uh, PR122 in it, which is a light fast color. It's just the dye that makes it fugitive. Potter's pink, also a fugitive color. Sorry, not fugitive. Hard to rewet color. Is there one word for that? I'm sure there is. I'm gonna let that soak in. 
Quinacridone pink, okay. Someone recently told me that their pink smelled. I can't tell. I mean, there's a bunch of dot cards next to each other. <laughs> it doesn't have a severe odor <clears throat> or anything, but someone told me that their tube smelled really bad. Uh, I don't know if that's normal or not. I always recommend if you have an issue with a tube of paint, contact the company and they will probably remedy it for you. There's a piece of the paper stuck to my swatch card. Thank you. Um, this is a really lovely color. It is slightly less light fast than the other quinacridone colors, so I didn't add it to my palette, but I do know I have heard John Near Laws say that this is his preferred magenta. He uses this in his palette, and it's made from PB42. Pretty sure. I'll double check. Yep, PB42. It's a really beautiful pink. And uh, John Muir Laws has a lot of sketching, so it makes sense that the light fastness isn't as important to him. I'm not speaking for him. I don't know that. He didn't tell me, but um, that would be my guess because they're part of the Nature Journal Club and everything. But it is really pretty. Then we have Quinacridone Rose. If I can stop spreading water all over my page. This would be your alternative to the quinacridone pink. You'd have like an either or. I don't think you need both. This one is slightly more staining. But otherwise very similar. Both series twos. Both non-granulating, both transparent. I personally think I like the hue better with the quinacridone rose. Maybe the quinacridone pink is a little bit more natural. And that's why someone might prefer that. You can go ahead and try our Potter's Pink here. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull out my Schmincke one, just so you guys can see it. This one does seem to have a lot of binder in it as well. The payoff is better than I remember in the last one. I can show you my last one it did not go very successfully. This was my last Potter's Pink swatch. So I definitely got more pigment. It seems to be darker, like slightly less pink, but let's take a look. The granulation in Schmincke's is a lot stronger. You can see this little guy, no, it's not directly next to it. Same hue, but Daniel Smith's is smoother. So if you want a less granulating variety, maybe go with the Potter's Pink. Maybe it paints differently from the tube rather than on the dot card. I'm not sure. But I am glad that that had a better payoff than the first dot card that I did. Cat hair, like always. Quinacridone Lilac was definitely one of their new colors. I remember that coming into the mix of things. And this one is the PR122, so what we would call quinacridone magenta. I think the quinacridone magenta is the PR202. So I did do a color spotlight on the two different versions of quinacridone magenta. Both of these pigments and names are quinacridone magenta, but Daniel Smith has separated them, so it's a little easier to tell in their line. I prefer the 122 over the 202, but if you check out that color spotlight, it'll show you the differences between them mixed with the same colors and that kind of thing. The magenta does have a richness to it, but I think it dries down a little bit duller. I probably should have mentioned this at the top too, in case I lost anyone, but if you'd like to see scans of this, I'm gonna go ahead and put them up on my Patreon for my patrons to see. And I actually have a really cool special going on in October, if you see this in the month of October. I have a free print that I am giving away to some of my higher tiers of a lion that I recently painted and totally love. So if you want to get a lot of really cool features, tutorials, a live stream that we haven't yet done this month that you can still be part of uh, if you're watching this at the time that it releases, um, make sure you go ahead and check out Patreon. I'll leave a link in the description below for you. We have lots of fun over there. It's grown to be quite a big community. We have team challenges. We've got a Discord server now. If you want to talk more casually to other patrons or myself, we'd love to see you over there. This is interesting. Um, 
pyrrole crimson is just like plop down here with the cool colors even though I would definitely have put this like where the road night is at the top of the page like I think it comes after this one um, it's made from PR 264 which is a somewhat typical color that I've seen before Okay, quinacridone fuchsia. We're back to the pinks again. Ooh, this is another PR202, and I'm confused as to why they didn't put this next to the other 202. It would have been nice to be able to compare them directly next to each other. This looks much pinker, though. Ooh, ooh, whoa. What is this? This is rated as transparent? I'm so confused right now. It's got a heaviness to it that I wouldn't expect from a transparent color. Hold on, Let me get out a little scrap piece of paper. No, I wouldn't call this transparent. It might be more transparent when it dries, but I don't know, we'll see. Semi-transparent, that's what I would call that. It's real weird. I don't know if you can see this again, because they're not next to each other. It's so much more pink. It's kind of a neat color. I could see that being useful for floral painters. Next is Maya Violet, and uh, this is PV58. I don't think I've ever seen that color before. Aside from where I'm sure I saw it on the dot card before. I'll check. really pretty it's very soft I would imagine the tinting strength isn't super high on that one yeah it was on here it definitely looks I just did my finger in it sorry guys uh, it definitely looks like just from numerous experiences on this page the potter's pink um, some of the other car colors that have been harder to rewet uh, well, I guess we'll know we're heading into a bunch of difficult colors, but I feel like this one was easier to rewet again. So we'll see if that holds true for some of these cobalt colors, because I'm really curious to know if maybe they addressed that in their formula and they made it easier to rewet some of those really tricky ones. Or maybe I just had no idea what I was doing two or three years ago <laughs> and uh, had a hard time. Who can say? This is Bordeaux. Bordeaux is beautiful color, one that I have struggled with wanting to put on my palette for a long time. It isn't as transparent as some of the other colors that are very similar in hue, but it's just got this richness that is super pretty. I would say, actually, after using that quinacridone fuchsia, these have very similar textures to them, and like they feel a little bit heavier than some of the other transparent versions, but it's a little bit more purple. so. Take that for what you will. Put a little bit more pigment here so you can see the payoff a little bit better. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's more paint on this sheet. I feel like I could go back and pull new samples and it would be okay. Here's quinacridone violet. I think this is PB19. Let's see which one. Quinacridone purple, I think, is on the next page. That's the PB55. They added a PB55 after Schmink added theirs, I think. It's a newer pigment. Very, very. Um, well, I don't know. This is another one that's kind of like the orange I talked about earlier, or like the red over here that I said leaned orange but had cool undertones. This one is a warmer purple, like it clearly has more red in it, but the tinted out version is very cool. Like there's a lot of blue undertones in it. 
permanent violet. Ooh, I forgot about this one, okay? So, hmm. I'm gonna guess that this is the new formula. I don't know why it wouldn't be. They discontinued the original pigment that was used for this. And it's no longer available, but I have the single pigment version. Trying to decide if I've poured one out or not. I do, I have it here. Um, it's this one. I'll label it later. I don't know for sure that the one on the dot card, like I don't know which version because they don't put the pigment numbers. And I think they maybe do that intentionally so that when they have formulation changes, they don't have to reprint everything. I don't know, but it would be nice just for clarification's sake, like when they switch from Quinn Gold or Sap Green. I think they look a little different, but it could just be the paper type. I don't know what the per the new version is made out of. It's I think it's two pigments. Um, the chart that I have is still showing PR88, which is what this one is. Uh, I know for a fact the one from the two is PR88, but they've replaced the formula. So just keep that in mind. Close that other palette up so that we don't get cat hair in it. And here's Perline Violet. Beautiful Perline Violet. Oh, also, if you're just finding my channel for the first time, uh, I talk about PR88 in my new Da Vinci Trio also. Da Vinci doesn't have a single pigment PR88, but they do have two different pigments, uh, two paints that are mixed with that pigment. Paraline Violet is great. It's one of those other Paraline colors we were talking about. And um, super, super beautiful, great mixing color. I just put three dots of water here and we'll see. Nope, we need to let this sit. Okay. I'll come back. Rose of Ultramarine then finishes off the page here. This is another very similar color to the Permanent Violet. I think it has more granulation in it. And it's slightly cooler. Before finding Permanent Violet though, I think Rose of Ultramarine was one of my favorites. see here it might dry a little bit lighter or maybe the formula changes a teeny tiny bit I'm not sure yeah I don't know why I never noticed this color it was on the old dot card I think maybe just when I was researching it I couldn't find anything on PR 88 I was making my palette out of recommendation uh, like recommended colors and if no one talked about that I probably would have been more reluctant to add it to my palette now with how many paints I go through and trying to do all these reviews and everything. When I find a pigment that I don't know about, I'm like, gimme, I wanna see it. I wanna check it out. Well, I don't think that this is any more rewettable than it used to be. I just think we left the paint or the water on the paint longer. So we got a little bit more of an even sample, but it's still pretty hard to rewet. This one's better. I think if you want cobalt violet colors, honestly, I would go with M. Graham. Theirs are so beautiful and have such a re rich payout and they re-wet super easy and like all M. Graham colors do. This one isn't bad, but there is, I can tell there's a lot of binder in it. So it's got a stickier feeling. And then we've got ultramarine red, which I think should just be called ultramarine purple, to be honest. 
ultramarine red is PV15. The violet is PV14. And this one is PV49. So yeah, if you, if you let your water sit on, you will get richer samples from it for sure. Or you can use them straight from the tube and that will prevent you from having to re-wet them. Uh, but still more difficult to re-wet. So that's our first page as well as the first couple colors over here. Oh, nope, there's one more. We got purple right. I forgot. Purple right is a Primatech color. Pretty sure. Am I making that up now? No, yeah, it's, it's a Primatech color. Um, and this is one I don't know why is not on their dot card. Again, I don't know if it's just general availability versus how many sales they get with it. It's a granulating purple. I think it's really pretty. It's got a really soft, like middle vibe. It's not super cool. It's not super warm. It's definitely less intense than some of the other purples. But it's really pretty. I like this more than I like their Amethyst. So Amethyst is in Daniel Smith's Primatech line and I think this color is prettier, just personally. It does not sparkle. So that could be good or bad depending on why you like Amethyst. If uh, you're trying to decide between the two. Amethyst sparkles a lot. We'll take a look at it on our next page. And this one does not. All right. So go ahead, take a stretch break. I'm going to take a stretch break. And then we're immediately going to jump on in to our next page. All right. I'm kind of excited for this next page. It's blues, which are not necessarily my favorite colors, but I haven't explored a lot of these blues since I got more adventurous of blues in general. So when I first set up my palettes with Daniel Smith, I had your very typical um, like ultramarine and thalo blue. I got thalo turquoise as well, uh, which I still love, but some of the other colors that I don't necessarily paint all the time with, but have a little bit more background with anyway, I'm excited to see what they look like in Daniel Smith's variety. So this is Imperial Purple. And I believe that this is another mixture. I'll check in just a second. It's kind of stubborn. Not gonna lie. It's uh, not wanting to like lay down a nice glaze of it. And it's literally just like moments after that last sheet. I didn't take that long a break. I didn't even stand up. Oops, painted over the word purple. Oh no, Ugh. I don't want to mess with the color because, oh no. I don't want to mess with the color because uh, if it's accurate, like it looks accurate for this sheet, but right now in my viewfinder, this looks way too blue. Of course, I will edit it as much as I can in post-production. Here's that quinacridone purple that I was mentioning before. This is one of their new colors. Where are we? This is the PV55 I was mentioning. Imperial Purple, again, is the same combination as Rose of Ultramarine, but has more Ultramarine. So it's um, Ultramarine and Quinacridone Rose. Ooh. Ooh, I like their version. This still isn't a color that I think I would ever use. I just don't have a use for it, but it's a lot more rich than Schmincke's version. I like it. Got a lot of color payoff. Ultramarine Violet is going to be another stubborn one. We'll let some water sit on it. Amethyst Genuine. Yeah, we'll let it sit for a second. Carbazole Violet uh, is their Dioxazine Violet. It's PB23. I think I've been using, like it's a really useful color and I recommend it for sure, but I'm still using the same tube of 
dioxazine that I originally purchased when I started watercolors, so I don't go through a lot of it. Um, again, they were out of Daniel Smith's version, so I bought a Winsor Newton tube uh, right at the beginning. This one definitely seems bluer to me than the other version that I've been using. Not by a ton, but definitely like I can notice it. Wisteria is another new color. It has a white pigment in it. I hope that's obvious. It's going to be um, a bit more opaque. I'm going to drop a dot of water on the cobalt blue violet, then we'll come back up here. That went pretty well once it had some time to soak. It's PB15. And then our Amethyst Genuine. It's a really deep color in its mass tone, and then it's going to lighten and be a really cool, like grayishy purple with lots of sparkle. For those of you not familiar with the Primatech line, they are actual stones ground up, so this is amethyst ground up into paint. I have mixed feelings about it. I was just talking about this recently. Um, I think it was on Otto's uh, Lapis Lazuli episode, which we're going to come to, and maybe we should save the rant for there. Um, but I was just saying that it makes me a little bit sad when I see some colors that aren't necessarily useful ground up into pigment because it's like, well, they were pretty stones and if they're not that useful for pigments, then why do we do it? If you use them, go for it. Like I'm not saying not to use them, but there's some others on the earth tone page in particular that I remember the first time I saw them, I was just like, why would you do that to that stone? It's so sad. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. This is a super intense version. I do feel like both of these were so much easier to rewet than on the first pass that I went through them. Cobalt Blue Violet is made from PB28, so Cobalt Blue and Quinacridone Rose. Moon Glow, this is um, Tori Ann's favorite Daniel Smith color, I do believe. Lots of people love Moon Glow. It's very versatile. It's made from three different pigments, right? Yeah, PG-18, so Viridian, Ultramarine, and PR-177. You can use it almost black in its mass tone, or when you tint it out, on proper paper at least, I don't know if it'll do it on this paper, it separates into those different blue green and red components, so you can kind of see a full range of colors. Then we've got Shadow Violet. Very similar color in my opinion. Um, it's made in a very similar way. It's made from PO73, which is an orange, PB29, which is ultramarine, and viridian. So the only thing that's different in Shadow Violet is they're using an orange pigment instead of a red pigment. I could see how these colors would be useful, but I have favorites in the Primatech line that I just use instead. Now they're both series two, so just depending on price point or any fine tuned characteristics that might sway your opinion one way or the other. Sugar Light is a sparkly color. I'm gonna let it reactivate. Same with Kyanite. Indigo should be wet for us though. Um, true Indigo is Fugitive. This one is made from PB60 and PBK6, so uh, Indian Throne Blue and Lamp Black. Well then.
if you couldn't hear that, I'm sure you could, but someone honked outside. I'm glad it was between words and not in the middle of one of my sentences. Mayan Dark Blue is one of my favorites. Uh, it's made from PB82. It's got a gorgeous granulating property. It's got a little bit more blue in it than the indigo has. Uh, it still gets pretty dark, but I just think it tints out really beautifully. Let's come back down to Sugar Light. Sparkles everywhere. I've mentioned it already, but if you're wondering about some of these Primatech colors or my, what their uses might be, Otto has a series called I'm sorry, I don't know the exact words. <laughs> I realized as that sentence was coming out of my mouth. It's a series on the Daniel Smith Primatek colors though. So go ahead and take a look at that. She's done comparisons on a lot of these colors compared to other more typical brands of paint uh, or names of paint. So that you would have an idea of what they look like in person. This kyanite is also sparkly, but it's a blue, kind of like a bluish gray green. I don't think this color we wet that easily on my last one. Let me check because that hue looks different to me. Oh yeah, holy cow. Okay, they used to be next to each other. They've gotten pushed down from all those purples that got added into the new line. That looks like a different color to me. Um, when you've got a mineral that you're grinding up, right? This is a Primatech color. The stones are going to vary, but this is like gray and this is way more blue. So that's really interesting to see. The sugar light looks very similar. Uh, this is darker because I got more pigment payoff from it, payout from it. Kyanite looks very different to me. I'm glad my memory wasn't totally deceiving me when I'm like, hmm, that looks like a different color. How my brain keeps track of all this is a mystery to me. I know I don't get everything right all the time. I definitely don't remember all the little details or every single pigment number, but it remembers more than I expect it to. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Especially with my fiber fog. Can't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning. I mean, I can today, but some days I can't but I can remember the kyanite that I swatched out two years ago did not look like that. It's real weird. Soda Light Genuine is another favorite of mine. It's a little bit um, dry looking, but it re-wets just fine. Sorry, we kind of skipped over Indian Throne Blue. Um, Daniel Smith Indian Throne Blue is a little bit more gray in my opinion, than like uh, Sennelier's or M. Graham's. Sorry, this box is getting out of control because I can't straighten out those edges. Um, it's still fine. I just prefer other brands and then throw in a little bit more just for the vibrancy. This soda light I use in place of uh, like a black, like a dark pigment, even though it's blue. And I actually, it's not up just yet because I've had some setbacks this month, but I did just finish filming for my Skillshare class over the weekend. And I put together a new palette. I'll give you a little glimpse. We're in like the middle of the video. So I feel like this is a little bit of like an Easter egg if you've made it this far, <laughs> um, where I put together this natural toned palette and I used the Soda Light in conjunction with Paraline Green to be my two darks for the set. I guess Bloodstone too, but I, think of that more like as a sepia color. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. I guess I can tell you guys a little bit about that. Um, I had a weird flare over the weekend that I think we've narrowed down to being 
part of uh, my CFS, my chronic fatigue syndrome, which is different than the fibromyalgia, and I didn't realize how different it was um, until I started having these really strange flu-like symptoms. I spiked a fever of 101. I couldn't work for like two days straight. Um, it was it was just really weird, and I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> uh, but it set me back a bit on my Skillshare class. Don't worry, I'm resting. You guys are always so great. I talk to my patrons. I let the people on Skillshare know it'll be out when it's out. I'm not gonna push myself to finish it, but everything luckily is recorded, and I just have to. Um, well, not just. It's a big process, but I have to edit all the clips together and put that up. But it'll be up soon. All right. So lapis lazuli genuine. I'll give it credit, it re-wet better than it did on the first pass. Let's take take a reminder. Take a reminder, this is the first one. It's like nothing. So yeah, I did better, but uh, Otto just did this color in her series and basically told people not to buy it unless you really, really, really have a specific reason you want this color. It's a series five, it's real expensive, and it's one of those things that you hear about it and I feel like it's, I'm not trying to offend anyone who has it and uses it and likes it, like if it works for you, that's fine. But for some people, I feel like it's just a bragging right. Like, oh, I have one of the world's most rare pigments and it, if it doesn't paint that well, just pick a different color and paint with it. And then I'm also a little salty. I mean, I love Daniel Smith, but this one color in particular, I'm a little bit salty because there's other brands that have a much more vibrant lapis lazuli than they do and like actually make use of the pigment and make it a usable paint. And Daniel Smith has these tubes that are so weak that <laughs> you have to use so much of it to, to get anything accomplished. So I just don't know why it's a color in their line. I feel like they could get rid of it. They did get rid of smalt. Um, I don't know a whole lot about this pigment, but Smalt was one that was on their old color chart and you can see like it barely lifted off this page. Um, and I feel like Lapis Lazuli is in the same boat and I feel like they could just get rid of it and we have plenty of other gorgeous options and I don't think anyone would miss it. Could be wrong. If you are a diehard Lapis Lazuli fan, let me know in the comments below, but I've not met one yet, at least not one vocally. And I have nothing, nothing against people using that if you want to. I just think it could be used in other ways. Or like if you really want to have it, just have it be a pigment that costs $50 a tube to get the right color payoff. And if you know, they only produce X amount of tubes per year because it's too ridiculous to stock such a high priced pigment and people who want it can buy it and people who don't won't. Anyway. That was longer than I needed to be, I apologize. But next we have Ultramarine Blue and French Ultramarine. French Ultramarine is slightly warmer than Ultramarine Blue, but otherwise they are the same in almost every regard except for price. French Ultramarine is a little bit more expensive. Otherwise, same light fastness, same staining, which is interesting. Y'all, did you know Ultramarine is a three out of four high staining color? Are we sure about that? I don't know. I always assumed it was a liftable color. I've always used it like a liftable color, right? Am I, am I alone in this? I don't think I am. Maybe a two. I wouldn't call it a three though. Okay. Uh, also our, what was this one called? This is the quinacridone fuchsia from the other page. You can see here, hopefully there's definitely some sediment here. I would not call this a transparent color. But anyway, we'll see. Then we've got cobalt blue. Very similar to ultramarine, except it's cooler. It's got more of a green undertone. I mean, I guess I could see why you'd prefer cobalt over French ultramarine. It has a brightness to it, but we've talked about this in other videos that I just prefer not to use cobalt colors if I can avoid it. Cobalt teal is the one I make an exception for because of the fact that it's such a unique color and very hard to replicate. Um, but there's a lot of ethical concerns with cobalts as well, so just trying 
try and research if you can. I wish they would have put the phthalo blues next to each other too. They separated them. This is the green shade. I do think Daniel Smith has gorgeous uh, phthalo blues. They're super pretty. I think they do a really, really top notch job. Yeah, I just don't know how you would call like phthalo blue and ultramarine almost the same staining level. Like this is a four and that's a three. That's a this doesn't make sense. Is it like that on the other sheet too? So the typo, like did it change somewhere along the way? Nope, it's listed as three. All right. I don't know how I never noticed that before. I don't know how you actually say this. I call it verditer. <laughs> it just sounds funny. I know it's not how I actually pronounce it, but... <laughs> Verditor uh, Blue. This is, ooh, it's a combination. So it's a hue. It's Cobalt Blue, PB36. Is that another Cobalt color? And white. So this is, this is a der derivative of Cobalt Blue. lighter more like a sky blue type of color but like a really vibrant sky blue it's not dull it's not like a light sky blue it's like polarizers on your camera sky blue <laughs> then we've got lavender which is interesting i've been evaluating this name lately because i've seen it used so often growing up i would have called this color lavender i always knew it as like a light purple but I understand I've seen the flower <laughs> and the original flower does look more like this color. It's just really interesting that we would have learned, like it was so ingrained to me that lavender was light purple and it's actually more of a light blue. Um, I do have a variety of lavender on my patio right now that is more closely related to this color, but that's not the standard lavender. Having lavender next to Thalo Red Shade though seems weird. Don't know who made that decision, but it's real odd. I love Thalo Blue Red Shade. I mean, I know it doesn't have quite as many uses because just because of the options. Like if I have Ultramarine on a palette and I've got Indian Throne on a palette, like this is very similar to those colors, but oh, it's so beautiful on its own. The green shade will give you more variety in blues, but I don't know. I like jewel tones. It's so pretty. Then we've got Prussian blue. Weird, weird Prussian blue. Super gorgeous color. Really weird properties and behaviors. Um, We've talked about this on the channel too, that it fades drastically in the sunlight, but is rated by pretty much everyone as being the light fastness of one. And then I did my own tests and it faded like crazy. And then I took it off my palette and shunned it and it's not allowed anywhere near my work <laughs> anymore, despite being how beautiful it is. Um, but I recently found my finished light fastness test that I had put inside of a binder. Um, about two and a half months ago, and the color has restored itself. Is that nearby, or is it gonna take me forever to find it? That is the question. I'm gonna look for it in one place. There it is, okay. Here you go. Came back. You guys remember this sled faded to like gray. It was gone. And it just sat in my binder for two months, two and a half months. I don't know at what point it restored because I didn't look at it in between, but it's back. So if you are just painting for yourself or friends, keep on using it. Just tell them about the weird thing. If you're a professional artist selling your artwork, I don't want to have to explain that weird property to clients when there are other options to use. But if you want to go ahead, just let them know like, hey, if you're painting fades, stick it in a closet. It'll be fine. I don't know. It's real weird. 
Next up is Mayan Blue Genuine. Have we gotten loopy enough on our page two? We're, we're about halfway done with the second page. It doesn't feel like it's taken too long, but I've started and stopped the camera a lot, so I don't actually know how long I've been recording. Mayan Blue Genuine was one that I was going to, did I? If I didn't add it to my palette, I was going to. I did. I wanted to play with it, so I put it on my new Skillshare palette because um, I wanted to kind of test out how it behaves because I haven't used it very much. Uh, just for more clarification, I don't think I clarified this at all, but my Skillshare class is on building unique palettes for yourself, not to copy the one I did unless you really want to, uh, but to know what kind of decisions making to use when you're putting your palette together so you can create a good one for yourself and your needs. So I made an earth tone one, earth tone inspired palette, jewel tone inspired palette, because I have 27 billion other palettes. No, I have like five other standard palettes, but that's still more than any one human needs in their collection. <laughs> so I didn't need another palette where I was just like, here's a warm and cool blue, and here's a warm and cool yellow, and here's some convenience colors. I was like, we're going off the rails. We're gonna pick some really unique colors here. Just to clarify, if you were wondering. Their Cerulean's also really hard to rewet. I would go with M. Graham's version. The payout's really beautiful if you want to use that color. I don't think you need to fight with your paint that much unless you're really, really a brand loyalist and just don't want to use any other brand. Uh, their Cerulean is made with PB35 if you're interested. Both PB35 and PB36 are Cerulean Blues. This next one is PB36. So, ooh, that one, that one's much better. Much better. I think it's a prettier color too. This is more sky blue admittedly, but I don't know what else besides the sky you would use it for. Whereas I could see this more as a mixing color because it's not as weak. They don't have manganese blue, very few companies do, but uh, we've got a hue which is labeled as PB15 and nothing else, but it has a white in it of some kind. Because as we know, this is what PB15 looks like. So if you have phthalo blue, just get some white and add it to it and you'll have manganese blue hue. I do think Daniel Smith's version is uh, like just on this first initial glance is better than the other versions I've seen. Other ones can be really chalky. This is not, it doesn't feel chalky to me at all. Um, it has a little extra binder in it. It's harder to rewet, but I don't feel like it's chalky. Cobalt Teal Blue. Hmm. It looks so green on the dot, but I think this is the regular one. Yeah, PG-50. Maybe it's a relativity thing. All the other samples have been so blue. This one looks so much greener next to it, but isn't actually that green. So that's cobalt teal, like a lot of brands would call that cobalt teal. We got a few shite, a water drop, come back. Um, I'm also going to put a water drop on this Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. And we will let this Thalo Turquoise take over for right now. Super gorgeous color, really handy for mixing. It's not a PB16 which is the single pigment version of Thalo Turquoise um, that some brands offer, but it's really, really beautiful. It's made from PB15 colon three, so this is Thalo Blue Green Shade and PG36, which is Thalo Green Yellow Shade. Then we have Ultramarine Turquoise, which is going to be Thalo Green Blue Shade, so PG7 with ultramarine. I don't know, it makes sense in my head, but I don't know how you guys keep track of what I'm saying out loud. 
She sounds like gibberish. Both of these look so green in comparison, and I think it's just because I've been staring at the blues for so long. Relativity is so cool. Such a cool thing. Um, here we've got fuchsite. Fuchsite is a very sparkly color. It's kind of like malachite if you've seen that color from other companies. You know, I think that this paper is just garbage at showing um, granulation because I know that their cobalt teal granulates a lot and you can't even tell that it's granulating on this paper. I of all people, after doing the entire Swatch With Me series on Arteza watercolor paper, which I found out I hate. understand that you want to go with the cheaper option because it just is more cost effective but if it's going to teach someone the difference between how beautiful your colors look when they're granulating properly versus like just a pile of paint go with the nicer paper <laughs> again they tell you instructions to use other paper so probably just doing it wrong but Guys, I just can't, I can't write out that grid again. It took so long. I remember sitting in front of the couch for days doing that big swatched out one, the first one I ever did. And if I were in better health, I promise I would do that for you. I would put in the effort, but. My shoulders just cannot handle that these days. And I appreciate your understanding and hope that you find this valuable and you enjoy it anyway. Mostly for a hue comparison. All right, we've got our Sleeping Beauty turquoise finally. This is another series five. And this would be what I would say if you're looking for an alternative to cobalt teal, this is the closest you're gonna find. You don't want to use a cobalt color. It's really beautiful. It's a little more blue, but it's still really light. Emma's Night Genuine is going to take a second to re wet. Blue Alkytite, I'll come back to. Here's Lunar Blue. Lunar Blue, I think, is uh, Thalo Blue and Black. Is that right? Yeah, Thalo Blue and PBK 11. So their lunar colors are really heavily granulating colors. We'll see some more. Um, how many do they have? I can only think of two right now, but I'm sure there are others. There's an earth tone that I've fallen in love with recently, but it's called Lunar Earth, which is funny. Someone pointed out that it's an oxymoron to have Lunar Earth, <laughs> but um, it's a really pretty color. Here's this Amazonite Genuine. This is like a softer version of Thalo Green. I think it's a bit closer to Thalo Green than um, a Viridian would be. Like a lot of people call Thalo Green Viridian Hue, but I think this sits in between the two. We have, yeah, we do. Let's put a dot of water on that now because that's going to take forever to be wet. And we've got Blue Appetite Genuine. This is another blue gray color. I think this easily, both of these easily could have been put over here somewhere with like the Lion Dark Blue or Soda Light Genuine. But I guess they have a little bit of a green undertone. Yeah, this, this paper, you guys, I'm sorry. Here I am trying to be a better person, redo all my swatch with me's on arches properly. Not even showing you the king of granulation on granulating water paper. Maybe that would be a cool idea. Now that I've thought about it two pages in, I just do like these random swatches for you guys. 
It's a lot of pressure trying to make squares. <laughs> but when this granulates, what I want you to see is that the blue separates from the black. It's not a Primatech color, it's two different pigments, but it has this definitely dual characteristic to it. I'll try and change my technique a little and see if I can get more of that coming out here. Will you do it, Cascade Green? Will you show us your two different colors? Cascade Green is um, a green and an earth tone together. I have to switch my thing real quick. Hold on. I think it's. I think it's th actually. I think it's Thalo Blue and uh, PBR Seven, like a raw sienna. It'll separate. Yeah, you can kind of see it separating there. Flip over my color chart here. So you can see them start to separate from each other. You can see the phthalo blue and you can see the earth tone and they'll continue to separate as they dry. And then we've got Jadeite Genuine. This is, um, a Primatech color and it has, it's a green color that has a blue undertone that kind of spreads out from that mass tone. If this, if this new technique works, I'm going to be so mad at myself for not implementing it on the previous pages. I guess all I can say is that there's very few reds and oranges and yellows that granulate, so at least I'm figuring this out before the earth tones. But we can kind of see more if I do the swatches this way by adding water and then have varying levels of it kind of spread out. I don't know, let me know which you guys prefer and I'll wait to film the second video, hopefully, until I've gotten a little feedback. I can do the mass tones. These can be really satisfying on some colors. Let's see these ones. I can change them up based on how I think the pigment's going to react. If that doesn't bother people, they're not all super consistent. Try and do what's best to highlight each pigment. I don't know. Viridian, I added Viridian to my earth tone palette to try and work with it. I just don't find it as versatile as Thalo Blue and I'd rather use Thalo Blue. I mean green. <laughs> Thalo Green. Um, Thalo Green can be tinted down really softly. You can also use it to mix dark colors. But this Viridian's nice and it's also made to use these two colors that so many people like. So. Diopside Genuine. Another Primatech color here. Very green. Bright, bright green. Finally, have Thalo blue or Thalo green blue shade. I swear they just did this to tongue twister us up. Thalo blue green shade, Thalo blue red shade, Thalo green blue shade, Thalo green yellow shade. Yep, got them. Okay. <laughs> So you can see here, I can understand how they would get 
Viridian Hue and Thalo Green, but this one is just so much deeper, so much more intense, doesn't granulate. I just don't feel like they're the same thing. Prussian green is not a single pigment. It is made with Prussian blue and something. Something, something, where are you? I don't know where it is. It's really pretty. Just be aware that there's Prussian blue in it, so that fading thing may or may not happen. I do have another mixture from, oh, here we go. It's a PY97, actually. So that Hansa yellow medium and Thalo, I mean, Prussian blue. Um, I have a mixture from Magello that if you've been around the channel for a while, you would have heard me talk about. It's called Magello Blue, and I really loved it before I found Anthroquinone Blue. Um, and it has PB27 in it, and I don't know if like the quinacridone color in that mixture protected it or something, but that color did not fade in the sun at all. And so it's very confusing. So I don't know if Prussian green would fade or not. I haven't tested it or not. Both of these are hard to re-wet, so we're gonna come back to them. Cobalt green is PG50. So this is actually the same pigment as the Thalo teal blue. Processed differently. I don't know how. Sorry, I can't answer that for you. But very different. Spring green is a three pigment blend of nickel titanate yellow, thalo green, blue, uh, thalo green yellow shade, and PY151, so a middle yellow. I just, I don't understand. I know, <laughs> I know you guys have told me before. I know that some places the foliage looks this color, but I don't understand how having this convenience color on a palette could ever be worth my sap green. Like, if I had to choose between the two, like, I just don't know what else I would use this for aside from grass. It's so bright. Does it mix well? I don't know. It's, it's such a confusing color to me. This one too. And this one isn't even light fast. Well, it's not excellent light fast. Which one's this made out of? Okay, this is just this is just thalo green blue shade and PY3, like Hounds of Yellow Light. I already have those colors on my palette all of the time. So having it on a well, I don't know, it just doesn't seem necessary. But I know you guys are looking at me and you're like, Denise, you know that 27 earth tones are also not necessary, right? And I'd be like, yeah, okay. You got me. This is the other thalo green, so thalo green yellow shade, and same yellow, PY3. Let's see if we can get this green going now. It's actually a very pretty color once it reconstitutes. I don't think I've seen a Terra Vert that dark before. Oh, there, oh, okay, okay. Theirs is made from Viridian and PBR7. So Viridian with one of the burnt siennas or raw siennas or burnt umbers or raw umbers. It's cobalt pale green. Green pale, cobalt green pale, is the hardest color we've come across so far. Worse than the lapis lazuli. It's got like a yellow undertone to it in the tints. What is this cobalt green pale? I 
I don't know why some of these are like invisible to me. Why am I not seeing this? Oh, it's on the other line. Oh, Cobalt Green Pale is PG-19. PG-19. Interesting. I don't like the way that's drying though. It's got like, it's one pigment, but it looks like it's got like an earth tone mixed in with it. I don't know. I think we've reached, we've reached that section team. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, before we, before we get further, I'm going to do the Kingman Green Turquoise, which I'm actually really excited for because I've never seen this color in person before. Uh, this is another Series 5 Hermitac color. Uh, a lot of people compare it to the Sleeping Beauty Turquoise, but I think that's only because they're similar price points and they both have the word turquoise in them. Uh, from what I saw on Otto's channel and what I can see here on the dot card, this is a very different color. Very different color. Yep. I don't think it's comparable at all. I mean, if you have to pick one or the other because of the price, I understand that, but they don't fill the same niche on a palette for sure. It's pretty. I feel like this is, I should have done this before. Um, this is kind of like in between Terra Vert and the Cobalt Green Pale. I can both see in the sample and on the swatch that there's a lot of binder in it. Oh, here you go, guys. Are you ready to see this? Here's your Lunar Blair. Oh. Your Lunar Black. <laughs> Lunar blue, oh my gosh, words, Denise, come on. Okay, so the black like heavily separates from the blue and you can't see that in that swatch, right? Arches does like to bring out gran granulation in pigments, but it's pretty extreme. Okay, so here's your cumin green turquoise. I feel like it shares similarities with Viridian, except it's more green. It shares similarities with Terra Vert, but it's lighter, like it seems airier. And it's similar in Cobalt Green Pale, but again, a little bit more on the green side and definitely has better coverage. I'm glad I got to try it. I'm glad I didn't buy a tube of it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> All right, per oof. permanent green. I think this is like my boyfriend's favorite color. He loves like, pow, green. It's be somewhere between here and here, permanent green and permanent green light. It's a very aggressive green. <laughs> permanent green is made from Man, usually their chart is really good about like going in order on here and on there, and these ones are sort of not lining up. This is again PG7 and PY3 in just different quantities. So all of these greens here are convenience mixes. And if you have any versions of phthalo green on your palette and a couple of yellows, you can make any of these colors. So I personally, if you're not using them for every single painting, would recommend just to mix them yourself. But if you want, to have it, you can. That is an option. Always an option. Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm sorry. We've we've reached Loopy Denise for sure. Hope hope you enjoy your stay here. We're almost done. Got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nine colors left. If I knew there were ten colors in the row, I could have done that math, but I forgot there were ten colors. All right, their hooker's green is very bright. It's kind of like Schmincke's sap green. They're just going off the top of my head. They have a really bright sap green. Their hooker's green is really bright here. Um, definitely has more yellow in it than the sap green, which we're gonna get to in a second. The hooker's green, oh, whoa. Hooker's green from Daniel Smith has four pigments in it. It has Thalo green yellow shade, oh no. That's what I get for tapping my paper. 
has Thalic Green, Yellow Shade, PY3 Hansa Yellow Light, PO48, which is Quinacridone Burr Orange, and PY150, which is Nickel Azo Yellow. I feel like I can't even see the Quinacridone Burr Orange in here. Like, I guess it neutralizes things a bit. Maybe it's the PY150 I can't see. I don't know, that's a lot. Oh, you know what? I bet you. Let's see if anyone can confirm this. I figured this out in my head while I was talking out loud. Did this color used to be made with quinacridone gold? If so, I understand. The supplement now for quinacridone gold with Daniel Smith is PO48 and PY150. So if Hooker's Green used to have quinacridone gold in it, they replaced it with their supplement for quinacridone gold. Okay, I get it. We figured it out, team. All right, Sap Green most definitely used to be PG7 and PO49. It is no longer made that way because of the lack of quinacridone gold, but it is uh, PG7 with those two other colors that I mentioned that make up quinacridone gold. So lovely. We should do that, shouldn't we, on here? Chef Quinacridone Gold and the original Sap Green. It's gonna look crazy at this point because like they're all out of order. I added a purple down here. We're gonna have those other colors there. It's gonna be crazy, but look at it, look at it grow, guys. I'm gonna have so many versions of all these colors. This is Serpentine Genuine. It's one of the uh, more cooperative Primatex from my experience. It's a very light green that has a light brown granulation that separates out of it. Chromium Green Oxide. I actually used this recently in a painting. It was the teeniest, tiniest little bit, but I used it on uh, that lion I mentioned that I painted for Patreon and for the bonus print. I used it for the eyes and it was perfect. I needed a nice muted like grayish yellow green and I mixed that with a little bit of yellow ochre and it perfect. Then we've got Green Appetite Genuine. I think this is one of my favorite Primatech colors. It's definitely my favorite green Primatech color. It is somewhat similar to the Serpentine Genuine. I know a lot of people kind of compare those two, but this one uh, is much richer, much deeper, and the granulation in it is like a deeper, darker brown versus like the light burnt sienna type brown that's in this one. Rare Green Earth, we're gonna let that re-wet. Deep Sap Green. Deep Sap Green is made from Prussian Blue, Hansa Yellow Light, and Quinacridone Burnt Orange. Got too much water, that's for sure. Perlene Green. I don't need to tell you how I feel about this one. You already know. You are, I don't even think you have to watch another video to know. I mentioned it earlier in this video. It's in my Da Vinci Trio. beautiful mixing color. I don't think it really matters what brand it's from. They're all gorgeous. And undersea green, I know without looking, this one used to have quinacridone gold in it. It no longer does. It is now made with PB29, so ultramarine, and then the mixture for quinacridone gold. So I have to imagine that before it was made with quinacridone gold and ultramarine blue on its own. And that is what it looks like. Really pretty. Looks like kelp, for sure. Definitely looks like kelp. How is this color? Like that doesn't look transparent to me at all. I don't understand. We've seen several of these that are just so perplexing to me. I guess, sure. I think if I did it over that line, like I did before with the Quinacridone Fuchsia, we'd see a very similar thing happen. 
this actually we wet way more than I was expecting it to. I had a big clump of paint on my brush that I kind of wiped off so we could get a better representation here. I always in my head think of rare green earth and terra vert as the same color, but maybe that's false. That square got way too big. I apologize. Uh, this one is made from PG 23. See, I think this is what I normally think of when I hear terra vert, but maybe I'm just uneducated, unknowing. All right, that's the second page. So we're basically gonna wrap up, but before you go, I will show you that sweet, sweet sap green and quinacridone gold. Oh, I really wish I'd put these in order. I did not have the foresight to put these in here somehow. All right, I'm gonna put this one here and I'm gonna put the other one below it because we're putting an earth tone here so the earth tones can go next to each other. At least make some logic in my head to make this work. Well, I'm so glad. If you notice, there's no quinacridone gold on my original palette. I don't know why. I don't know when I found it. I don't know how I found it, but I'm real glad I found out about it and put it on my next palette before it went extinct. Somehow, somehow I managed. All right, well, we don't have the quinacridone gold yet because that's on the earth tone page, but we'll have it here when it's time to compare and I'll show you the comparison with the sap green. It's close, it's close. So there's just a glow. There's a glow. I can't explain it. It's gorgeous. The new version isn't bad, but this is where it's at. <laughs> so I hope you guys have enjoyed this look at the first two pages of all of the Daniel Smith watercolors. I have had fun. I hope you don't mind how loopy I got in these second versions, how uh, casually the conversation started flowing and uh, if you didn't like it well I have lots of other videos well first off if you didn't like it, I don't think you'd still be watching but I have lots of other videos that are not stream of consciousness they are edited and highly tuned to be more presentable so you can check those out if you want and otherwise I will see you guys in the next video be sure to check out that patreon if you want to find out more about that special offer going on in the month of October Keep an eye on my Skillshare for um, the new Skillshare class that will be out soon, as soon as I can get that edited. And it's good to see you guys all again. It's been a little while and I've really enjoyed this. So thanks so much for watching. Comment down below. Let me know some of your favorite Daniel Smith colors and I will see you in the next video.